So um, our, our speaker today, uh, speaker today is, is Mike Cerny. He's the uh, uh, our new executive director uh, or director of missions, as you might call him, for the Maine Baptist Association. Uh, and the right that I need to undo is that Mike, Mike was actually here visiting with us, what, uh, probably a month and a half ago or two months ago. And I never introduced him, which is really pathetic on my part. He did he knew in that position. Uh, he's replacing Keith Lawrence. I mean, some of you remember Keith Lawrence. He's been here a lot of times and, and helped us in, in a number of ways. Mike is now in that same position, uh, serving in that capacity. He's here this morning you know, to speak to us. And uh, I look forward to what he has to say. And I'll do it. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, kids, to go to the church. Where's my baby? Let's go to the church. No. Well, good morning. What a blessing to be here. This I got to say, Pastor Tom, this is the absolute biggest pulpit I have ever preached at. So I, I could... I might have lunch here today. Uh, this is this is really easy to work with. I appreciate that. Thank you so much uh, for having us here. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, as Pastor Tom just said, uh, took on the role uh, December first uh, as the director of the Maine Baptist Association. Uh, I pastored up here in Maine uh, from 2002 to 11 uh, in Waterville, Living Water Community Church. Uh, my wife and I are native uh, New Englanders, natives of Massachusetts. And uh, we were up here, and then God called us uh, for the last 10 years uh, to the state of Maryland. And so we're pastoring down there. And then last year, uh, right around this time, uh, I got a phone call from Keith Lawrence, uh, my predecessor here. And he said, would you consider coming back to Maine, uh, as Keith has been trying for the last two years during the pandemic to retire, and uh, would you consider coming back uh, in, in the role of director of missions? And so when he called me about last April, May time frame with that, I laughed. I literally laughed at him. I was like, oh, no, 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 that's not for me. That, that's not me. Well, then, a month or so later, he asks again. And this time, I did the Christian thing. What do you say when people ask if you're going to do something? You say, yeah, I'll pray about it. That's exactly what I said. I'll pray about it. Well, a few weeks after that, my wife said, are you praying about it? And I said, no, no, I probably should be. <laughs> oh, no, just be honest. You know, true confessions here in church. And so I started praying about it. And then God just, you know how that works, you know, and then God just starts leading you in a direction and called Keith and said, well, let's talk about it. You know, we start talking and then in, I think it was June-ish, uh, we flew up here uh, for like a day or something and met with the administrative team and, and your pastor is part of that and about a half a dozen others. And we talked over pizza for, I don't know, an hour and a half. At the end of that, we walked away saying, okay, we'll come. And we started, you know, the whole process, sell our house, da, da, da. And, and it was December 1st uh, that we moved up here Thanksgiving week and uh, hit the road running December 1. My wife, I wish she could be here today. She's with our daughter uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our daughter lives there and uh, they're wedding dress shopping this weekend. And yesterday in one hour, uh, first appointment, she said yes to the dress. So she bought a dress uh, yesterday, getting married in the fall. Very excited for that. And uh, my, our son, uh, John, he's 25, and he uh, is here with us. We live over in Sydney. And uh, so I'm just thrilled uh, for the opportunity to get around to the churches of the Maine Baptist Association, a network of 26 uh, Southern Baptist churches across the state uh, that partner together uh, to impact the state of Maine with the gospel. We're so thankful that you, Western Mountains, are part of that network, an integral part of that network. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of that. Uh, today, we're going to be, in just a few moments, I encourage you to take out a little, little cheat sheet, little outline there in your uh, worship guide today. A little bit will be in Numbers chapter 13. I'll give you advance notice on that because Numbers is that book that you got to usually have to peel the pages apart because uh, we don't get to that book too often, I don't think, because there's just a lot of lists, you know, and it's easier to just kind of skip through those things. Uh, but we're going to be in the book of Numbers chapter 13 in just a little bit. Um, so I'll give you a chance to, to, to get there, but I gave you a little history about myself. Uh, let me give you a little uh, other history lesson you may be more familiar with. Uh, back in 1803, President Thomas Jefferson, uh, he negotiated what was known as the Louisiana Purchase. See, back then, the United States only extended as far west as the Mississippi River. And so 
Jefferson, he purchased all this land that today makes up uh, most of the Midwest and up toward the western United States. And what he had to do next was explore the land that they had just bought. So what he did for this huge task was he appointed his personal secretary, a name that you'll probably recognize, a man by the name of Meriwether Lewis. And Lewis brought on a guy onto his team who was really good exploring the frontier, a man by the name of William Clark. You know them as Lewis and Clark. And so what they did was they set out to fulfill President Jefferson's mission, which is extremely clear. Jefferson said, find a water route to the Pacific Ocean from the Mississippi River. And that's what they set out to do. They and their very, very brave band, they set out in some very, very treacherous terrain. They set out to navigate through the unknown. They had to go upstream through Indian territory, across the Rocky Mountains, some very, very difficult situations. And yet eventually they got to the Pacific Ocean. And when they come all the way back, 8,000 miles round trip, they traveled. And they brought back to President Thomas Jefferson detailed maps about the passageway to the Pacific Ocean. It's so easy for us, 200 plus years later, to kind of take all that for granted, you know? Now you can just hop on a plane and be to the West Coast in under six hours. No big deal. We just take it for granted. But this morning, for just a moment, I challenge you to kind of put yourselves kind of in Lewis and Clark's moccasins or whatever they were back in those days and think about the challenges that were before them stepping out into an unknown frontier with all the risks all the uncertainties all the dangers but they did it anyway they did it anyway you know when it comes to stepping up faith and wholeheartedly chasing after god's mission Oftentimes, we are afraid, don't we? Oftentimes, we focus only on how challenging, how difficult, how risky it will be to step out and do something that God is asking us to do individually or as churches. And the fear is often very, very real, but here's the reality. Fear, folks, does not have to keep us from stepping out in faith. Fear does not have to keep us from stepping out in faith. The future may look challenging, and it often does, and uncertain, and fear and anxiety, those well up in us, that we're human beings, those are real things, we can admit that, but we don't have to let those things keep us from stepping out and doing those things that God calls us to do. You know, that kind of fear is nothing new. I mean, way back at the beginning of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham to go to a land, he said, that I'm going to show you. I'm calling you to step away from your people, step away from your family, and go to this place they call the promised land, this land of, of Canaan. That started way back early in the book of Genesis. Now, if you fast forward to our text today in Numbers 13, that's a gap of about 700 years. For seven centuries, God is promising this place. And now in our text, we're going to find that God's people are on the brink. It just steps away, a stone throw away from this promised land. You know what it's like going three, four, five hours with kids in the back seat to try to go somewhere? What's that annoying question you hear over and over and over again from the back seat? Are we there? Yeah, you know it. Can you imagine how many times in 700 years God, people, the leaders of God's people heard those annoying questions? Are we there yet? Well, guess what? We're there. We're there. We're right on the brink. But before they can step into the promised land, God's got a few reminders for them. Some advanced planning he needs for them to do some keys he needs them to remember and to know and to grasp before they enter in. So as you follow along in your outline this morning and your worship guide, here's the big idea this morning. It's this. Even though there were challenges ahead, we're going to find that Joshua and Caleb were not afraid to step out in faith. Joshua and Caleb were not afraid to step out in faith.
And that concept still applies to us today, despite real challenges ahead in our lives and in our churches. God still calls us to step out in faith. It's not changed in all these years. So we're going to ask a question and answer it from our text this morning. The question is this, how? How can you and I gain the courage to step out in faith? How can we do that? And from our text in Numbers 13, we're going to find three sources of courage for stepping out in faith. Three sources of courage for stepping out in faith. Here's source number one. You can step out in faith as you remember that the mission, the mission is commanded by God. The mission is commanded by God. Let's begin reading there in, in Numbers 13. I'm going to read the first two verses to start us out this morning. Numbers 13, beginning in verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. So let me ask you, as you look at that text, who's the speaker here? It's the Lord. The Lord is the speaker. What's the command? The command is to send men to spy out the land. So the speaker is God. The command is send men to spy out the land. That word spy out, and you may have a different translation in front of you in your Bible. It literally means to search, to explore, to scout out. A, a literal definition means to give careful examination of. Give careful examination of. So this doesn't just kind of poke your head in and look at the land and come back. No, this is carefully studied, carefully examine the land. God's calling the people here to make a, a reconnaissance mission of the land of Canaan. But don't miss from that text I just read you that this command comes with a great reminder that reminder is, this is the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. This is the land which I am giving. This is the land I've been talking about for 700 years. This isn't just a random piece of real estate. And this is not just an optional piece of land. I'm not asking you to go poke your head in and decide whether or not this is the right land. God is saying, this is the land, the same land. I promised way back to Abraham is the land I brought you to the brink of. There are no options here. There are no choices here. This is the land with a capital L. And God is saying, go check out that land. Now jump ahead to Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. It says, then Moses sent them. He had just listed in the preceding verses the names of all the people who would make up this party to go out and explore the land. It says, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up this way into the south, go up over the mountains, and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in it is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, or whether there are forests or not. So now God's getting a little bit more specific about this reconnaissance mission. A little bit more specific about exactly what he needs them to do. He says, go check out the land. See if it's good, bad, rich, poor. Are there a lot of trees, not a lot of trees? He says, go check out the people. Are they strong or are they weak? Are there a lot of people? Are there very few people? And then he says, check out the cities. Are they set up kind of like camps, kind of spread out? Or are they very fortified, like strongholds? And then notice this, the latter half of verse 20. God says, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. God issues two more commands here. 
Two more critical commands. And the first one is be of good courage. Aren't you glad that God knows it takes courage to step out into the unknown? I'm so glad to know that, that, that when God says to step out, he's not stepping back on, ha, 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 I hope you make it. No, God says, I know this takes courage. I recognize this is difficult. I recognize this is challenging. And I'm telling you, be of good courage. You can do this. But he, don't miss that second command at the end of verse 20. It's easy to just skip over this. He says, bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. What's God saying there? He's saying when you go in, bring back a souvenir. What do souvenirs do? They remind us of where we've been. How many of you have those mouse ears with your name stitched on the back? You can admit it here in church if you have them. And <laughs> your kids, your grandkids may have them, but you know what I mean? It reminds you where you've been. So I was thinking about this. I'm thinking the, the wallet in my pocket. I got this on a mission trip in Nicaragua seven years ago. And as I see it, it reminds me I'm too cheap to buy a new wallet. But it's, it's like it reminds me of my trip. When I see this thing, there's no labels of who made this. No, it was handmade there in Nicaragua. It reminds me of that. That's what souvenirs do. Remind us of where we've been. And that's exactly what God is saying here. I want you to remember how fruitful this land is. I want you to bring back a souvenir. So up to this point, up to this point, the mission's been clearly established by God. Now, it's a matter of following through. Now it's a matter of following through on the mission. It's the follow through that makes all the difference in the world. Just knowing the mission exists is not enough. It's what we do with that that makes all the difference in the world. And since I was a kid, I've had this obsession with the U.S. Secret Service. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a Secret Service agent. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And, and I think that obsession started back on March 30th, 1980. That was the day that President Ronald Reagan, you may have a photo behind, yeah, President Ronald Reagan was, was leaving a speech right there at a hotel about a mile from the White House. And as he was walking out the door of the hotel, it was about a 30-foot ride to his limousine. And you would think that that would be a day that the Secret Service could kind of take it easy. You know, he's going 30 feet from the door to the limo, a mile down the street to the White House, no big deal. You'd think they could cut corners. You'd think that they could say, oh, this is just a no-brainer, maybe we could not send as many people and just kind of take it easy on that day. But I'm so glad that that's not how they operate because the mission of the Secret Service is to protect the President of the United States at all costs. That is their mission. And on that day, they fulfilled that mission. See, immediately after this photo was taken, within seconds after this photo was taken, a man by the name of John Hinckley, who was right behind that red and blue umbrella there, he lunged forward and fired six shots in the direction of President Reagan. He ended up hitting the press secretary, a DC cop who's in the photo, and one bullet ricocheted off the limousine and did strike the president. But that day would have been far, far more tragic if it had not been for the Secret Service agent in the light blue suit there, a man by the name of Tim McCarthy. Because Tim McCarthy understood the mission of the Secret Service. And he understood fully what it means to follow through with that mission. Because as soon as the shots began to ring out from behind him, he spun around and he did what they teach them to do. Make yourself big. And Tim McCarthy made himself big in front of President Ronald Reagan. And Tim McCarthy took a bullet to the stomach for that. He survived and he's doing well today. But things would have been far, far more tragic if Tim McCarthy had not fulfilled the mission of the Secret Service on that day. It wasn't enough to simply know what they were supposed to do. He had to actually step out and act in that on that knowledge. Folks, it's not enough simply knowing our heads that God's commanded us to step out in faith. It's not enough to just know it in our heads. We're to act on that command. 
We're called to step out, even when the future looks uncertain. Even when God's mission looks risky, God says go. The guidelines are clear. Have courage on the journey. God has spoken, but head knowledge is not enough. Head knowledge is not enough. It's what we do with that knowledge that makes the difference between God's blessings and missing God's blessings. Here we are, about 34 or so, 100 years after this event, and not much has changed. God's mission for the church is clear. He says that in Matthew chapter 28. We call it the Great Commission, the last two verses of Matthew's Gospel. He says, go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, teaching them to obey all things I've commanded you, and I am with you even to the end of the age. He says, go and do what? Make disciples. Disciples simply means students or followers of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. A follower, a student of Jesus Christ. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, go make church members. It doesn't say, go make Southern Baptists. It doesn't say, go make Sunday school teachers. It doesn't say any of that. It says go make disciples. Why? Because disciples who are properly trained are going to want to be good church members. Disciples who are properly trained are going to want to be sharing their faith. Disciples properly trained are going to want to be teaching others in the church and outside the church. Disciples properly trained are going to want to love on their neighbors and love on their communities. That's what disciples do. Genuine disciples want their church to be a place of healing. They want their church to be a place of transformation, a place of of grace and not of judgment. That's what disciples do. They want their church to be that city that's set on a hill, that people know there's something different there, that we're shining a light to the community around us. That's what disciples do. Now, let me tell you, can I whine for a little bit here? Can I whine? Is that right? Not about you, just in general. For years, there was a uh, church growth philosophy. A lot of books are written about it and all that. And there's truth to it, but I want want to kind of turn on its head from it. This idea that they use this term, say, churches need to start closing the back door. And by that, what that meant was people come in and visit churches, and they they stay around for a little bit, but they just never connect. They never join. They never meet anybody. They never get in a small group. They never build relationships. And so the terminology, they slip out the back door. And no one ever notices because they didn't have relationships. They were not connected with people. So no one even knows that we're there. It happens in every church. And so for years, there's this, all, all this written on, we need to close the back door of the church, close the back door of the church, close so that people don't slip out. Yes, there's truth to that. That's real. That's important. However, let me give you a new way to think about this. Imagine if, if in addition to closing the back door, imagine if we turned the front door of our churches into a revolving door, meaning that we come in on Sunday mornings and we get revived, we get refreshed, we get encouraged, we get motivated, we get challenged, and then we go back out that front door, that revolving door, into your families, into your neighborhoods, into your communities, into your workplaces, into your schools, and you tell people that something's going on there. God's doing something at that church. God's transforming lives. God's doing amazing things, and I want everyone to know about it. Imagine if our churches in Maine had revolving doors instead of just closing the back door. Imagine the difference that could make. Think about it. The mission of the church is clear. The mission of the church is commanded by God. Here's the application in this first point I want you to hear. I will step out courageously and be part of God's plan. I will step out. You see, as we unite together around a common mission, then all of a sudden the stuff that divides us, it doesn't matter so much because we've got a common mission of making disciples 
of seeing people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You can step out in faith as you remember that the mission is commanded by God. But there's a second source of courage and challenge I want us to see this morning in our text. You can step out in faith as you remember that the missionaries are called by God. The missionaries are called by God. Back to Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to go back to verse 2 and read it again along with verse 3. Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. And verse 3 says, Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the children of Israel. And now jump ahead to verse 16. He had just listed them all. He said, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Joshua, a name that's very familiar to us. So in this case, God told Moses, send these leaders to fulfill the mission. And their names were all listed here. And we learned that Caleb and Joshua, two of the 12, will be part of this reconnaissance team to spy out the land. You know, as I told you earlier, the Old Testament goes to great lengths to list names, to, to list names of people, lots of them, who are called to certain tasks. Why? Because you can't separate the missionary from the mission, the person from the task. Well, the mission began very generically in verse 2, send men to spy out the land, but now God moves to the specific, and he lists the leader of each tribe who's going to go, and he names them. The names of the specific leaders. You know, over in the New Testament, God does a similar thing in establishing the local church. In, in the New Testament, however, instead of naming a bunch of specific names to do certain tasks, today we're all called together. We're all called to join together to support the work of the local church, to accomplish the task of disciple making. Listen to how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul puts it this way, Ephesians 4 verse number 15 and 16. It says, speaking the truth in love that we may all grow up in all things into him who's the head, Christ. Now don't miss verse 16. Christ from whom the whole body, that's the local church, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. We'll talk about that according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I don't want you to miss that phrase there, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. What's a joint? It's a place in the body where, where two points, a point at which two things come together. Two things come together. According to this passage, the church can only be effective when members join together to build up the church. Folks, if there's no coming together, the mission is not accomplished. If there's no love, according to this passage, the mission is not accomplished. If there's refusal to use our gifts and our talents and our abilities, there's no mission accomplished. Have you ever watched an anthill being built? <laughs> if you have absolutely nothing to do this afternoon, <laughs> it's going to be a nice day. Pull a lawn chair out somewhere along the edge of your driveway and just watch. It's something about anthills. They're not there one day and they're there the next day. How does that happen so efficiently? Here's why. The reason that can happen is because there's no ant sitting on the sidelines. If you watch, and I know you're going to do this now. If you watch, here's what you're not going to see. You're not going to see a bunch of ants scurrying around over here. And then over here, a bunch of ants with their, I don't know what to call those, but like this. Saying, I'm not going to help build that ant hill because I don't like the way they're placing that sand over there. I do it differently. You're not going to see that. And you know what else you're not going to see? You're not going to see some over here going, you know, 
I built a lot of anthills in my day. Let some other people build the anthills. I'm just going to watch. You're not going to see others saying, you know what? I'm going to go over to the neighbor's yard, and I'm going to build an anthill over there because I like the way things are done over there and not over here. You're not going to see that. No, why does the anthill get built so efficiently? Because everyone does their part, and the job gets done in an amazing way, in such an amazing way that we can't ignore the fact that God chose to name the dirty ant in the Bible as a positive example. If you don't believe me, let me read to you from Proverbs chapter 6, where we read, go to the ant, you sluggard, that means a lazy person, consider her ways and be wise. Has no captain, no overseer, no ruler, but provides her supplies in the summer, gathers her food in the harvest. The ant got their name in the Bible, and I didn't. Go figure. Yes, pastors and leaders, elders, deacons, all called to go ahead, a few steps ahead, in order to help prepare a plan of action. But in the life of the church, we're all called to come behind and move together toward that common mission. You can step out in faith. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're part of the team. You are part of God's team. You are valuable in the mission, even if you've been convincing yourself you're not. Even if you believe that your abilities are not what's needed. Even if you believe you don't have anything to give. Even if you believe you just don't have the time or the energy. God says you're important. You are vital to this mission of Western Mountains Baptist Church. You're vital for reaching this community. See, don't let yourself convince yourself otherwise. You are important. Here's the application on this second point. I will trust God to use me to accomplish His plan in the church or through the church. Three sources that God wants us to know this morning. You step out in faith. You remember, number one, the mission is commanded by God. Number two, the missionaries are called by God. This third one's a little tougher. You can step out in faith as you remember the mood is chosen by us. The mood, the attitude is chosen by us. Numbers chapter 13, beginning verse number 21. So they went up. That's this team of 12. They spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. They went up through the south, came to Hebron, Ahiman, Shishai, Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol. There cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes, carried it between two of them on a pole. Picture this. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster, which the men of Israel cut down. Simply means cluster. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So we see a couple of things here. We see the first of all, the leaders, they obeyed. They spied out the land just as God had said. And they obeyed. They brought back souvenirs. They brought that cluster of grapes so big that it was on pole. It had carried on poles. But here's where it gets tough. Verse number 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, they brought that word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So they start out with the positive. They start out with the good news. They say, we did what you told us to do. We were obedient. We went and checked out the land. We brought back the souvenir. Look at these grapes. Look at how big these things are. And look at verse number 28. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Your translation may start with the word but. Or however. Folks, whenever you say God said do this and you insert the word but. Let that be a huge red flag. Let that be a huge 
red flag. When I'm saying, yeah, God, you're right, but here are all my reasons. This isn't going to work. Let that be a huge, huge warning to you. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land, they're strong. The cities are fortified and large. We saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. Hittites, Jebus, all the ites are there along the banks of the Jordan. So they're saying, you know what? The people, they're strong. The cities are fortified. And all these scary people are all over the place. Folks, I was recently reading some survey results about spiritual beliefs in the state of Maine. This survey was done in 2017. Let me read you a couple of things I pulled out of the survey. Jesus actually rose from the dead. In the state of Maine, according to the survey, 47% agreed. The U.S. average was about 52%. This was done nationwide. Another one I pulled out said, belief in Jesus does not require participation in a church. In the state of Maine, about a little under 49% agreed. Right at about the national average of 50%. But here's the one that really struck me. Jesus is the only way for human salvation from sin. U.S. average about 44%. The state of Maine, less than 37%. Let that sink in. Let that sink in for just a minute. These are scary results. I wonder if it's so difficult to start a church, grow a church here. I wonder if it's so difficult to talk to your coworkers, your neighbors, your family members. But here's the challenge. Here's the question for us this morning. Will we let these statistics scare us away from the mission? Will we let these dark statistics scare us away from the mission of making disciples? Look what happens in verse 30. Then Caleb, one of the twelve, quieted the people before Moses. And he said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. So here's Caleb representing tribe Judah, and he makes a startling report. Let's go take the land. Can you picture the faces of the rest of the group when he did that? They just told that the cities are fortified, they're big, they're strong, and all these ites are in the land. And he says, hey, let's go. He must have looked at him like he was nuts. Well, look what they say in verse number 31. But the men who had gone up with them said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we've gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Folks, the naysayers, they jump in real quickly, don't they? They said, no, 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 we, we can't do this, Caleb. Let me describe it to you this way. They're like giants. And we're like grasshoppers. They're going to eat us. Don't naysayers have a way of doing that? Don't naysayers have a way of exaggerating their negative reports? It even happens in the church. Now all of a sudden everybody's in fear and believing them. This group did what God said. They spied out the land. And what they saw in the land moved 10 of them to fear. And only Joshua and Caleb with eyes of faith. Why? How is that possible? They saw the same land, the same giants, the same obstacles, but came back with radically different opinions. How is that possible? Here's my take on this. The majority opinion was based on the idea that taking the land was merely a suggestion and not a command. Merely a suggestion 
and not a command. Don't we do the same thing? Don't we do the same thing oftentimes? You know God's leading you in a certain direction. You know he's leading you to step out in faith, but we start to try to find a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. Like, God, I'm going to tell you all the reasons that it's not going to work. And God's calling a church to step out in an amazing way, a way that looks outside the box, looks risky, and we try to find all the ways to say no. God say, I'm trying to lead you to say yes in faith. You can't do this without me. Only the minority in our text viewed what God said as a command and not an option. They recognized they weren't there to vote on whether to take the land. That was not the purpose. They spied it out so that could aid them in planning so that they could step out in faith. God did not send them there to vote on his plan. That was not the intention. Folks, obstacles in church, obstacles in the Christian life are not licenses for us to view God's mission as optional. It's still a command. The mission has not changed even when the circumstances have changed, even when our culture has changed so radically, even when our world has changed so radically. God told the people in that day to go and take the land. Just because there's scary people doesn't change God's commands. Just because your situation in your life is scary and uncertain does not change God's command to step out in faith. Folks, I read you the statistics. In our state, this is certainly not the time to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. This is not the time to live as if this is not a huge task. God says these are the days to go forward and make disciples. The statistics, they are dark, but the mission stands firm. And don't forget that when these people, when they made this negative, dark report about the land, what were they holding right in front of them? The souvenir. The grapes. And this wasn't like grapes that you get at Hannaford. It took a pole. Two men holding on their shoulders to hang these things. That's how big these things were. So even with the souvenir in front of them, they still said, no, this is an impossible task. And 10 naysayers were able to negatively influence a larger crowd. Folks, too many followers of Jesus Christ have no problem trusting him for eternity, but we struggle to trust him today and to trust him with our tomorrow. God says, you can trust me with all of it. You can trust me with all of it. Obstacles are actually opportunities for faith. Here's the final application this morning. I will choose to maintain a godly attitude and move toward the mission together. Together. I started out by showing you that map of the Louisiana Purchase. I, I want to kind of close with another interesting map I want to show you, it's actually on display at the British Museum in London. It's an old mariner's chart. It was done in about 1525, the year 1525. And it outlines the, the North American coastline. That's what's on the left side. It had yet to have been discovered. And the man who, who drew this, this map, he made some interesting things that he drew across the Atlantic Ocean. He, he wrote words like, here be giants. Here be fiery serpents. He wrote all these scary things in Old English all over this map. Well, about 300 years later, in the early 1800s, the same map came into the hands of a, a British explorer by the name of John Franklin. And instead of caving into the fear that was written all over that map, John Franklin instead added three words to his map, to that map in his day in the early 1800s. He wrote these words, Here is God. Here is God. Now imagine with me the state of Maine. Imagine a map of the state of Maine and, and all the way 1.3 million people within its borders. They're your co-workers. 
They're my neighbors, your neighbors, classmates, friends, and family. Imagine now, in light of all the statistics that I read you earlier, imagine we have a choice. Given the reality of what people across the state of Maine believe about God, about heaven, about hell, about Jesus, about forgiveness, about all of that, we have a choice to make. We can come into our churches on Sundays, we can pull the shades down, and we can do our thing, and we can leave pretending nothing happened. Or, or, we can come in here and get encouraged, get challenged, get motivated, and go out through that revolving door and show the people of Maine that God is a God of hope, a God of forgiveness, a God of grace, a God who wants to forgive their sin and give them a home in heaven one day and to shut, tell the story of what happened in your life, of your transformation, of God's grace in your family and let people know he wants to do the same for them. We have a choice to move forward into the great unknown with faith. God says there's grapes out there. Go get them. Go get them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father God, we just thank you that you are a, a God of grace, a God who still clings to the mission of using us to go and make disciples. And God, I just pray for this church. I thank you for the ministry of this church. I thank you for the, the life that is here, the relationships that are here. Lord God, we know that you, you've placed this church in a state and our, the rest of our churches as the Maine Baptist Association and so many others who are preaching the gospel throughout this state. You've put us here for a reason. Not so we can just gather together on Sunday mornings and feel good about ourselves, but so that we can take the encouragement and the challenge from your word and to go out and make more disciples. God, I just pray for the ministries of this church. And Lord God, I just pray for what you're going to do in the days ahead as they celebrate your word going forth, as they celebrate lives being transformed by the gospel. We look forward to hearing those stories despite the darkness of the land. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we close in song this morning?